Cool. Can you hear me? Sweet. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is John Engelman. If you don't know who I am, I am a, oh, come on. There we go. I'm a chief software technologist for OPI. Uh, I focus mostly on our DevOps capabilities. Um, I'm also a core team member of the Rat Pack open source project, and I've authored a number of great old plugins and contributed back to that uh, core, core application. Um, if you want to follow me or talk to me on Twitter or GitHub, those are up there as well. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about using Gradle and Docker to take your source code off, to take your application all the way from source out to deploying it. Uh, we're, this presentation is not uh, what is Gradle or uh, what is Docker. Uh, we'll talk, I, I'll give a little bit of an intro on that, but I've kind of based this around the assumption that you're a little bit familiar with that. Uh, if we have time at the end and we have questions about specific capabilities of those tools, uh, we can we can talk about those then. Um, also, at any time during this presentation, if you have a question, just you know shout it out or raise your hand or do whatever you want. Um, I'm not too particular about that stuff. Uh, topic. So we'll, we'll do a quick intro on Gradle and Docker, and then we'll start talking about how to build, how to do continuous integration, continuous deployment, um, and build pipelines with these two tools. So what is Gradle? Um, it's an expressive, declarative, and maintainable build language uh, that allows us to automate any type of build. Now, it is written in Java and Groovy, but that doesn't mean that you can only build Java or Groovy projects with it. Uh, you can build just about anything in it that you want. It does do dependency resolving and management. Now, this is a specific Java capability. You can use the dependency resolver to just grab arbitrary artifacts, you know, files or zips and tar files and explode them and do things with them. Uh, but generally, this is uh, structured around doing dependency resolution for Java or Groovy applications using the Maven resolver. Uh, it's a build task scheduler and executor. So all Gradle builds are based around the concept of tasks. Those tasks have dependencies. And so it creates an, uh, a task graph of how to execute that particular build, depending on what you put into it. Unlike tools like Maven, uh, Gradle is designed from the ground up to do incremental task execution, which means that every task within Gradle tracks its inputs and outputs. And when you execute that task, if the inputs and outputs haven't changed from the last run, it won't execute that task again. So it's much faster than something like Maven, which always executes your entire pipeline from start to beginning, even if you haven't changed source code. Uh, Gradle is also build by convention. So it ships a number of core plugins. Uh, these plugins assume that you have a project that's structured a certain way, and it, it wants to build it that way. However, it doesn't mean that it's locked into that. All those, all those parameters are completely configurable within Gradle. And you can do it right within your build description. Uh, this is a good quote. Gradle is an opinion, opinionated framework on top of an unopinionated toolkit. Tr trouble's talking today. Um, what this means is that the core of Gradle is components and modular and, and is plugged together. And then on top of it is just a thin layer of convention mapping. Um, like assuming that your source code is in source main Java for Java programs. What Gradle isn't? It's not Groovy Ant. It's not the Ant build system written in Groovy. That, that's a different tool. It's called, it's called Gantt. Um, and there, so it's completely different. So if you ever hear someone, you know, talk about Gradle and they say, well, it's just, it's just a Groovy DSL on top of Ant, they're wrong completely. Um, it's not true. <laughs> Uh, some of the core Gradle features, again, build by convention with flexibility. Uh, it uses uh, Groovy DSL to describe your build, so no more XML. It supports both Ivan and, uh, Ivy and Maven dependency resolution. It allows for multi-project builds where you have a single build that contains a bunch of children, and those children can contain children and so on. It's very easy to add custom logic to a Gradle build. Because the DSL is a Groovy DSL, it means you can write arbitrary Groovy code inside of your build definition. 
So you can loop over things or dynamically create tasks based on content within your, uh, within your project directory, uh, things like that. And you don't have to go out and you, you don't have to extend it by authoring a Java plugin and then putting that on the class path. That you can do that. that, that is the preferred way of adding plugins to Gradle, but you also can script it right into there. There is first pass integration with Ant Build, so if you're gonna migrate from Ant to Gradle, you can just import custom Ant tasks directly into Gradle and it will execute them. And there's an extensive public API and plugin ecosystem. If you're interested in this, you can go to plugins.gradle.org and that's the plugin port plugins there. That's relatively new. Not every Gradle plugin out there is in the portal yet. It's up to the plugin authors to put them in there. Uh, but they're moving in that, that direction. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, task up-to-date checking. And this is how Gradle uh, does the increment of, incremental task, uh, task, task execution. Uh, Gradle is flexible. Like I said, uh, just because it is a Java program itself, it doesn't mean that your your project has to be in Java. For example, this is a this is a snippet of a Gradle build file that we use uh, at my client to execute Grunt builds. So Grunt is uh, Node.js applications JavaScript, and there's an author out there that has written a uh, a Grunt plugin. That's a, that's the plugin name right there. And then we can have Gradle execute our grunt builds dynamically. So we can actually make our Node.js and Angular, Angular you know, projects participate in the same build as a Java application. Uh, so this is really, this gets really interesting if you're in like a microservice architecture where you have, you know, a couple different microservices that are feeding some Angular front end or or backbone or whatever. And you can actually put them all into a single repository and have a single build, build, build all those items across. Um, another one of the really important features of Gradle, uh, which we're going to rely upon for this particular talk is plugin composition. What that means is that any plugin in Gradle has the ability to react to any other plugin that's being applied to your build. And you don't, and it doesn't necessarily, it, it can react in that it's out of order as well. So it doesn't matter which, if you write it correctly, it doesn't matter what order you apply plugins to your, to your build. Um, this is just kind of an example. This would be the apply method from a custom Gradle plugin. And you have the, the apply method and you can, you can tell this project that plugins that with type. So that, what you're doing there is inside the curly braces is actually a closure that you're passing to this method. And so you're registering with Gradle and telling it that as soon as the plugin list contains a plugin that extends from the Java plugin class, I wanna execute this action, which would be this closure. So even if I apply my plugin first and then apply the Java plugin, as soon as the Java plugin is applied and executes its apply, then I'll be notified and I can execute my custom code. So I can, I can write a plugin that can do things, you know, configure items for any project, and then in particular, if it's a Java project, apply more configuration to it. Um, and I can do that for a number of plugins if I want. We'll see how this works in a little bit here. Uh, so that's a quick overview of Gradle. Uh, and then what is Docker, the other kind of core component that we're talking about today? Docker is an, app, is an application container tool. It's actually built on top of uh, a number of capabilities that have been in the Linux kernel for a long time. Uh, so it's, all it is is really a, a tooling framework around those um, and then a way to package up these applications. The idea is that you're isolating a process with Docker. So each Docker container executes a single process internally to it. You don't have, it's not a, it's not a virtual machine. You don't, in general, run an init system inside of your Docker container, right? So you can't you, you can't register upstart files and, and do things. Some people have done that, um, but the idea is that when you launch a Docker container, there's a single process. So PID, if you go into that Docker container, there's a single PID, PID one, which is normally your init subsystem of a, lin, of a Linux or Unix box. 
but that process is actually whatever process you told that container to run. So that's the only thing running inside of there. It's portable packaging. So the idea here is I can package up the entire environment for this application and ship it off to something else. I don't have to rely on certain libraries being available on that machine. I, it's all contained together. Why is this good? Uh, so we, we're abstracting our application, not only our application language, right? So with Docker, I don't care that you wrote something in Java or Scala or Ruby or Node.js. It, it doesn't matter to me because from the perspective of a running server, I'm executing a Docker container. Everything else is happening internally to that container. Um, so I'm, I'm abstracting both the application build language, the application language, and that build chain of how to build that application or execute it. Right? I don't need for a job application. I don't need to have the JVM installed on my server because your Docker container is going to ship the JVM internally to it. So if I have multiple people that are relying on Java, I don't need to provide them from my server anymore because you're going to build your Docker container with with the version of Java that you're reliant upon. So you can you as an application developer can. It's uh, write, write once, run anywhere is kind of the concept. And this is an asterisk here because Docker is only supported on Linux machines. <laughs> um, so, and that's because it's, it's using things in the Linux kernel or Unix kernel to, to, to do this stuff. Um, there is a Docker, so there's a Docker agent for, um, for Windows and Mac. So you can, you can run the clients, but what's really happening is, um, Every time you use Docker, you're, you're running a client program and that's talking to a Docker daemon that's running somewhere. Normally, if you were on a Linux system, you're talking through a Unix socket, right, to the daemon that's running on your machine. Now, for Windows and Mac, what, what you end up doing is you end up running a VM that has Linux in it and you talk over a TCP interface between your client and that daemon. So you're basically shuttling commands off to another machine. In this particular scenario, it would be a virtual machine on, on your same box, but it could also be a remote server somewhere else in the world. Uh, like I said, we can define our OS level dependencies into our application package. So I can start, uh, I can build my Docker container. I can specify that I'm starting from, you know, CentOS <coughs> or Ubuntu or anything like that. I can, I can specify all of that. And I can add exactly the packages that I need at exactly the version that I need, need them. And this is really helpful because it eliminates the, well, it works on my machine type mentality. If it works on your machine, it's going to work on his machine, or it's going to work on her machine, and it's going to work on the server out in production because everything is running inside of that Docker container. It also allows us to increase our resource utilization on machines. So cloud computing, you know, we, especially in microservice type architectures, there's a, there's a habit of running a single process on a machine, right, to, to isolate things, to make them repeatable. Um, with Docker containers, we get all that isolation. Uh, we get all that repeatability, but then we can put multiple of, of them on a machine without them interacting, without them badly interacting with each other in any way. So because of that, we can, we can stack up we can stack up more resources on a single machine and schedule it across a cluster. Um, and that, of course, is good because it's cheaper, usually. Docker containers uh, versus virtual machines. Uh, what really is the difference? Um, with a Docker container, you're going to get a smaller distribution. Uh, that should probably have an asterisk by it, too, because it depends on how you're distri distributing them. Uh, we'll talk about it in detail in a sec, but you can either you can either distribute your Docker containers as um, they come in layers, which I'll, I'll I'll describe in a minute. But you can either deploy out the the layers that have changed, or you can bond, you can export the entire Docker container as like a tar, and then copy that tar file somewhere. Now, when you do that, it has to collapse all the all the layers together, so you get a pretty big tar that's usually like 700 megs or something like that because it's an entire operating system. Um, right, so we're relying in, when we get the smaller distributions, if we do it that way, we're sharing the OS, we're sharing um, things that could potentially be on the base system already if we can make that assumption. Uh, and then we're only packaging up only the changes and only the differences that we need. 
uh, in, a, in a container versus a virtual machine, we're isolating each process. Um, so we get our, each process is getting its own isolated user space and network stack and file system compared to any other process. And they can only talk to each other if we directly open those, um, that communication between those Docker containers. Uh, how it works is, without getting into too much detail, is the Docker daemon creates a, net, a virtual networking bridge on your machine. And then when you launch a container, that container gets an IP address with, on, within that bridge. And then you can map those, you can map ports from that Docker container back to your host machine. So if you then, if you need that container to be publicly routable from the world, you actually are, you're doing kind of a, a port forward basically from the real interface on a port into the virtual interface on the Docker container. Yes, Steve? Is the file system then RAM based or does it provide disk image capability to the host machine or? How does the file system handled? Sure. The question is about the, the virtual file system for the container, exactly how that's handled. Um, there are a number of drivers to actually run the file system. Um, I'm not totally verbose in, in what they all do. Um, like AUFS is, is kind of the default one on Ubuntu. Um, I can't think of the other. Device Mapper, I think, was the other one. And so they are. They are files on your file system that get stored, um, but there's a detail about it. I think it's this next slide. Yes. So what a Docker image, so a container is a running copy of a Docker image. And a Docker image is a read-only virtual file system. And that file system is comprised of various layers. So every time you make a change to that, um, to that file system, you have to commit it. It, it works a lot like, a, uh, like Git or SVN where every commit on the file system points to its parent. So you only, so each layer only comprises of the changes from the previous layer. And so it, it stores those and, and keeps a hash of those on the file system. And when you actually launch a container, it, it traverses that graph back and builds up the file system. I think it runs in memory from that point forward, but don't hold me to that. Because I, I, I have not dug that far down into how it, how it all works. Right, so the file system is comprised of layers, uh, and each layer is atomic changes to the previous or parent layer. And then a container is a, Docker, is a process with a read-write layer on top of that Docker image. Right, so when you launch, when you start a container from an image, it builds up the file system from there, and at the very end, it puts a read-write layer on there so that the running process can actually write to something. Now, interesting enough, like if you if you destroy that container, that read-write layer goes away and you've lost any changes that you've made at that point, unless you've specifically told that container to commit out and create a new image from its currently running state. So this is how we also pull in that repeatability. Right? I, I can be guaranteed now with Docker containers that when I launch, when I start a container from a particular image, I'm going to get the same copy over and over, regardless of if I had it running before. As long as I don't reuse the same container, I'm going to start from the same clean state every time. So I could I could go in and I could play around with with my process in there. I could change some configuration, uh, you know, trying to debug something. And then if I want it to all go away, I can just destroy that container and start a new one. And I'll be right back to how I originally began. There's also additional metadata that we include into these containers. So that includes uh, environment variables that we want to pass in, uh, networking configuration. So this is like our port bindings. So we tell if we want to map, if we're running a web server inside of our Docker container and we want, and that's on port 80, and we want it to be available on port 80 on the actual machine, we have to tell it to map, you know, the internal port 80 to my host port 80 as well. So that's all part of the definition of that container. So how do we use Docker in, uh, in a continuous deployment type environment? So it's useful because we can, we can define the entire deployable from the ground up. When we push this out to a new environment, we only need to push out the layers that have changed. And Docker does all that for, for us. We don't, have to, we don't have to tell it what layers to push. 
Um, like I said, it, it's very, if you look at it, it's very comparable to Git where you have a SHA for an image and you can put an arbitrary tag on it. I can call this, you know, my, my app. And when I tell a server to pull that my app image, it can calculate it, it can figure out, well, my app is pointing to this SHA and I don't have it locally, so I'll copy that down. That SHA's parent is this, I don't have that, so I'm going to copy that one down. And it'll do that entirely until it gets to a spot where it already has something. So usually when you're first starting up a new Docker server, on your first pull of a container, it'll take a while because it's, it's got to download a bunch of layers for stuff. Uh, usually that's, you know, like an Ubuntu or like an OS, which is going to be pretty substantial. But as long as you're building off that same stuff, then everything after that is fast. So we only deploy those changed layers to a server. So how do we set, how, how do we use Gradle, Gradle and Docker then to create a build pipeline for us? Well, we're going to do something kind of like this, like my ASCII art. Um, we're going to use Gradle to manage this entire pipeline. And our pipeline is going to consist of four different stages in it. We have our, we're starting with our source code, then we're going to do compilation and testing on it. Then we're going to package up our distribution, and finally we're going to deploy that out to a server. So Gradle is going to manage the task execution from start to end of that entire sequence. But we're going to utilize Docker to do the packaging and deployment part. Uh, so some of our key components that we're <coughs> using, uh, Gradle has a core plugin called the application plugin. Uh, so these are these are links. So when we send the slides out, uh, I'll try and make sure that I include the URLs in those. <clears throat> the application plugin is one of those kind of responsive plugins. So if you if you have a Java project in Gradle and you apply the application plugin, it knows exactly how to package up that program as a tar or zip distribution that you can send to somewhere. Uh, so that's important because it, it packages up all the libraries, it creates uh, scripts to actually start that application. And, and we're going to, we're basically going to use that convention later on when we apply Docker then to this. Because if we know that format of that application, we can then create a Docker container of it pretty easily. We're going to use the Gradle Docker plugin. Uh, this plugin, the, there's a couple of them out there. The one that I like using is from Ben Mushko, who's He's a, a Gradleware employee, so he works on Gradle full time. And uh, it, it's really good. And it's really good because it, it's also a reactive plugin. It, it responds to the fact that you have the Java plugin installed and that you have the application plugin installed. And it, it automatically configures itself. So we don't have to do a whole lot other than just adding the plugin to our build. And then on my machine, I'm going to be using Boot to Docker, which allows me to you know, set up the environment like I was describing with a virtual machine and everything. So how do we do our basic continuous integration? So this is our basically our source compilation and testing that we'd want to do for our application. For a Java app, I'm just going to apply the Java plugin. Uh, the repositories block allows me to configure external sources for dependencies, uh, JSON or Maven Central. If I'm if we have internal libraries being hosted on our own Artifactory or Nexus server, you can put the URLs and any credentials that you need here. Uh, the dependencies block allows me to actually declare what dependencies I need for my code. Once you've done that, for a basic Java application, everything else is configured. At this point, it knows your source code is going to be in source main Java. You're going to have test code in source test Java. Um, and you'll be able to run your tests and build a jar file out of this. So with that simple definition here, doing a Gradle build will execute any unit test that we have, assuming that you've added a unit test dependency to your test scope. Right? So you've added JUnit or you've added Spock or whatever your testing tool is. Um, so to, it'll run our tests and it will build a jar file for us and, and we got that. Right, so that's basic. That's our basic CI pipeline, right? So on every commit on you know on a Jenkins server, we're going to check out our code and we're going to we're going to do a Gradle build and we're going to check to make sure that we can compile everything, test everything, create a jar file. The next step then is to actually create our distribution for this, and this is basically telling Gradle how how to run my application once it starts. So if we apply 
this application plugin for now. It'll automatically configure itself up because we also have the Java plugin installed. And the only other piece of informa information we need to tell it is where our main class is. Where, what's the main method that we want to run from the command line? You know, here we're saying sample.myapplication, you know, and all we need is a static void main method in there. And then Java <laughs> will be, be able to launch it. Once we do that, we can, that plugin creates this dist tar. There's also a dist zip if you want that different format. Uh, so running that then will, will, it'll resolve all our dependencies. It'll create a staging directory that, and it'll copy any external dependencies into there. It'll create uh, start scripts for both Windows and Unix in there. And then it will copy in our application code as a jar file as well and then package it all up as a tar or package it all up as a zip. You can copy that and run that in. Right? What it doesn't include is you would still be reliant on this point to have the JVM on a running machine. You'd still need Java to execute any of that stuff. So then from there then, because, you know, we, we could deploy that, that zip and that tar out to places, but since we're, we're going to take this the whole level to Docker, we're going we're gonna to configure Gradle to actually communicate with Docker and then use that, that tar and zip distribution to build up a Docker container for us. This is a little bit of configuration of how to do this. So if you're using Java and an application plugin in a simple, in a, in a simple setup like this, um, the plugins declaration here is just a little slightly different uh, declaration for the newer versions of Gradle. So don't get thrown on that. I just didn't want to be so verbose. Um, so Ben's plugin ships two different plugins inside of it. There's a, a Docker remote plugin or something like that, which just gives you like basic Docker commands. So you can just, you can write your own tasks. Or you have the Docker Java application plugin that you can apply. And this one's reactive. So it sees that you have the application and the Java plugin installed. And it assumes that since you're, since you're using those conventions, it can, it can build a Docker container assuming those same things as well. All we have to do in, in my scenario, since I'm on a, a, on a Mac, I have to tell it how to talk to the Docker daemon. So, this 192.168 address is the IP address for the VM on my machine that's running <clears throat> Docker. And then boot to Docker creates uh, its own self-signed SSL cert for encrypting the communication between the client and the daemon. So I have to tell it where that cert is on my machine as well. If you were running this on Linux, you wouldn't need this block at all. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, you wouldn't need that at all. It still talks over the TCP interface because it's a Java app and it can't talk over Unix sockets, um, but it it self configures itself. It knows how it knows how to talk to a locally running da daemon by default. By just applying that configuration now to my build, I'll have this Docker build image task. And so by default, the plugin the plugin assumes that your uh, that your Docker container is going to be based off a publicly available Docker image. Entitled Java, I think, it, and I think it defaults to like Java seven. Like, I think it's like the Open JDK seven, but that's entirely configurable. If you want to change that, you can totally change that. Um, so it, it's going to start structuring a container such that it has Java on it, then it copies your code into place, and it says so it knows um, you were using that application plugin, and it has those which created those scripts for launching the Java app. It knows that it can set the Docker container. To, stop, to launch the process by calling that same script, right? So since it copied all that stuff into place, it, no, it, can, it, it can just set that container to be, to tell it to start up using those scripts that are there. So the comms between Docker and the daemon. So Gradle, so Gradle's using the Docker Java plugin, which is then making REST calls out to our Docker daemon. So that's important because that's how we're gonna do the deployment later, because we're, we're doing everything over HTTPS here probably would make sense to see some of this stuff in action here. So I'm just going to initialize a, a very basic Spring Boot application here. Right. So if we 
we look at our build by Gradle file. Now there's there's some extra stuff in here, but you don't need to worry too much. So this is going to be a Groovy project. Um, we're using a Spring Boot plugin that those authors have created that basically just configures a bunch of dependencies for Spring Boot for me and such. Um, and it's already applied by default. This little templating program has applied this application plugin for us. It's also set our main class and it's created this sample application class in here for me, which is just a, a very, very basic hello world. So if I, at this point, if I run Gradle run, So that, that compiled up this Spring Boot application and is running it now. And if I, I go to localhost 8080, I get this little hello world JSON response back, right? Okay. Now if, you know, so if we, we can look at the task graph here, um, a, a nice switch if you're ever like debugging Gradle build is just dash M at the end, which tells it to do a dry run. So if we were gonna run Gradle build, <laughs> these are all the tasks that would be executed at that point. So it's gonna compile our Java and Groovy code. It's gonna uh, stage up some resources for us. Uh, it's gonna create start scripts for us. It creates the tar and zip distributions. Um, this is a Spring Boot specific task that's running. All right, so if I, if I run Gradle build, yeah. there it was running tests for us. We'll ignore that for the moment. If I go into my build directory, I'll see. So in build libs is where it actually created the um, the jar file itself. Oops. And then if I look in distributions, there's the tar file and the zip file that we were making as well. The unspecified is because I didn't have a version set. So we'll set set a version here. Uh, There, so there's my tar file with, with the version on it. There's also in install, let's make sure I'm using the right version of Gradle here. So install this tells it to take that that distribution file that it created and then do an install of it by exploding that tar file up. So if I, so it's a good way to check what's what's all in there. So if I go in a, into my build install directory, I have this hello world folder. Inside of here is a bin and, bin and a lib. Inside of lib, there's my, you know, there, all my dependencies are in here. There should be my actual, Yeah, I'm not seeing our code right now, but it's in there. Uh, and then the bin directory, you know, so we have uh, these different scripts. So if we look at one of these, you know, it's just a basic shell script for launching Java, which you can see down at the bottom here. So it, here's that actual, oh, come on. I don't know why this won't scroll over, but that's the, that's that class, that main class name that I configured in my build by Gradle. So it so Gradle copy that used that to template this file and, and create it. All right, so I'm gonna launch another editor here so we can. That's not the directory that I wanted either. So 
So now our next step would be to add our Docker information to this. Um, so I'm going to copy this from right here. So let's see here. I want to put that there. This guy. And then, since I'm on this Mac, I'm going to copy this as well. So here's that Docker configuration. I'm just pointing it to my local VM with that cert. Uh, in addition, I've added these registry uh, credentials. So Docker runs a public uh, repository for images that you can push to. So these are my credentials to actually be able to, to push, to send an image up to there. And we're going to use that because that's going to be part of our deploying sequence. The last thing I've done is I've told Docker how to tag that container when it builds it. So it's going to apply a tag using my Docker Hub username, which is required so that I can, so that that image is scoped to me when I push it up to the hub. And then I'm just giving it the same you push through. You can you can do a private registry. So you would just um, there's another configuration option in here for the registry URL that you would have to specify for that. And then you would most likely have another cert that you'd have to unless you're running an insecure registry. Um, so we the client that I work at we do that. We run our own private Docker registry for that. All right, so now, Docker build image. I'm just going to put on the info flag for Gradle so that we actually see some some output from Docker. Usually, the doc since the Docker command is being executed as a task, it, it kind of masks all that input from us. Or maybe it's still going to mask that input. So here we can see that it's it's tagging that image for us. There we go. It did it at the end. All right. So here and then here's the actual steps that it's doing inside of Docker. All right. So it's basing us on a, a generic Java image. This SHA is that, that's the commit SHA of that layer then of the file system when it was done creating it. So Docker has an entire caching system. So as long as nothing changes in the layers before, it'll just reuse that same layer. So it's actually really fast as long as you aren't changing things and you structure your Docker commands in a way that, you know, so like your application code should always be the last thing that you add to the container because that's constantly changing and you can then cache everything behind it. Um, we added just a maintainer tag to it. Um, so this particular plugin right now relies on that distribution, right? So we see that it's copying that my hello world tar file into the root directory of the machine. And Docker, when it when it sees this, <clears throat> when it sees that this is a tar file, it automatically unpacks it on the other side. So it's not just copying the tar file directly, it's copying and exploding it on that container. It's then setting my entry point. So this is this is what the container will run when I launch it, when I start it. So it's specifying in this hello world 1.0 directory, then in the hello world script, right? So that's the script that Gradle already had created for it. It's also exposing port 8080, which is just the default that the plugin configures. So, which works for us because Spring Boot by default talks to port 8080. What this allows it to do is you have to tell the container to expose that port in order to map it to something on the host system. Uh, and then that appears to be it. That's all that's doing. So if we if we go into our build Docker directory, that plugin is actually because Docker is not not a Java app. We actually invoke it to this REST API. We still need to to create all the files that it wants 
So inside this build Docker directory is how we've actually staged the files for creating this Docker container. So we've copied over our hello world tar, and then we've created the Docker file. And that Docker file is what actually is telling Docker what to build, right? So these, these are the lines in there. So you can manually create, yeah, using Docker normally, you would write these, your own Docker files like this. So we've automated creating the, that file from Gradle. There was a question? Um, so the question is if you're using Tomcat, if you wanted, if you wanted to do something different. Um, I don't. I'm not, I don't think that there's any built-in support directly for. Uh, you can, but that so that line is being created by the plugin, right? So in that scenario, I wouldn't use this Docker Java application plugin because it's not. It's not really a doc. It's not a Java application. You're building like a WAR file, yeah. right? So in that case, then you would write your own custom um, Docker file task, and you would add these commands yourself. I can show you an example of that. Um, these slides actually, not those ones, these ones. These slides are being, are, uh, I wrote this in reveal.js, so that's using grunt to, you know, build up, build itself up, and it's using uh, node to actually run a web server. This is running inside a Docker container on EC2 right now that I deployed with Gradle and everything, so. And I can show you that file. So here's our here's our build.gradle file. So I added this Docker remote API plugin instead of because I'm not a I'm not a Java application. I configured my Docker credentials. So this IP address and port is the public IP address for an EC2 instance that I launched out in Amazon. Uh, I created that instance using another cool another tool called Docker Machine. It's from the it's from the same people who write Docker, and it's just a it's a tool to provision Docker instances or machines. Um, so it created it created its own search for that to encrypt the communications, and then I created this Docker file task, right? So there's actually a Gradle task called Docker file, and then I can I can create all the entries in there, right? So here's my I'm telling it to add a line, a from line into that Docker file. And I'm going to be using the node container that's out there. So in that scenario for a Tomcat app, I would probably do this where I can manually create the Docker file myself. Um, you could, instead of using this Docker file task, you could also just, you know, put a, I think, I think the plugin lets you have like a source Docker directory and you could just put a Docker file in that and it will copy that and just use it instead of writing your, instead of doing it this way. So you could probably customize it that way as well. Um, so this is, yeah, all right, so back to so this. All right, so once that, world. Right, so I can see that when I when I ran that build it created this this Docker image right here. Now if I well, I want to actually scroll down my there's more information here and I don't know why my my display is not showing it but um, there's a SHA number associated with that and, and I'll and all sorts of things. I wonder if I can. Oops. Docker images. There we go. That's. I'll try and make that big without projectors, right? So. This is my this is my image name that I've created. This is the tag, so I can I can I can apply different tag. I can use the same image name and apply different tags to different images, right? So 
we could set it to include the version inside of that tag. So every time I build a new version of my of my application, I get a new Docker tag as well, right, with the same version number. So I could reference, I, I could then correlate my Docker containers and images right back to the application source code. This is the raw SHA, um, how long ago it was built, and then this is, this would be the, if you exported this as like a full image, that's how big that would be, it'd be 600 megs. Um, right. So the next thing, so how do we then get this? Um, yeah, we'll skip over that. Right. Um, so then how do we get this container out to our, our running machine? And I'm gonna do a bunch of copy and pasting here again, um, but we'll talk about it. So here, everything from here up, right, this was, just adding plugins and configuring some URLs in Gradle. And that and that got me the that got me the image run on my machine, right? I built a Docker image on my machine. But now I want to put that out on a on a remote computer and I want to run it. So I created a bunch of tasks here. And we'll just catch this up. And most of these are just saying, uh, the key here is for all these tasks that I've just created, I've, I've changed which Docker daemon they're talking to, right? So before, I, when I was building the image, I was doing that locally on my, on my machine, but now I'm gonna be talking to the Docker daemon out in that EC2 instance. And the important ones here are this uh, remote create. So I'm gonna create a container using that same name, right? So this is just the same syntax that I use to, to create my, my image name. It's just my, my Docker Hub username and then the name of this project. And then I'm just gonna be using the latest tag. Um, so that will create an image or create a container from that image. And then I, this command will actually start it. And when I start it, I wanna map port 8080 um, to port 8080 in that container. So, now, if I, if I look at this Gradle deploy command, uh, if I switch directories. Right, so if I run Gradle deploy, it's gonna do, it's gonna stop any running container that's out there currently, and it's gonna remove it. And then I'm going to pull down my new image on that, on that machine. And then it's gonna create a container and start it. So the idea here is I'm gonna, I'm gonna build my image locally, I'm gonna push it to Docker Hub, and then I'm gonna, on that remote machine, I'm gonna tell it to pull down that, that latest image and then start a container from it. So if we, let's see here, I know we're kind of running out of time here a little bit. Um, so right now, if I look at, Right, so there's nothing running on port 8080 on that on that machine right now. And if I, so I'm going to switch over my my Docker agent to start talking to my remote machine. So that that's where Docker machine comes in handy because I can quickly switch my my options there. All right, so there is we have a couple of containers running. One is this. Is this guy here, this npm start. So that, that was my reveal JS presentation that's running. And so and now it's running this uh, my hello world application as well. So now if I refresh this page, I'm getting my hello world app out there. And so we can now that Gradle's doing all of that, we in our CI job, we could set up a single command. We could say, okay, when you know if we're if you're using Jenkins or Travis or whatever, you can on every commit to your to your source code repository, you can just tell it to run Gradle build deploy, which will, you know, compile, test, build a Docker container, and then push and restart that container out on a remote running web server. So you can, in a single command, do that entire chain from beginning to end. And if you want to get even more, you know, if you have multiple stages, you have a dev QA staging environment, you could configure your Gradle build to be able to execute that kind of deploy command to any number of targets. So you could actually do kind of a build promotion type activity between them. 
So, so let's say you can change where it's applying to. Can you change what it's applying to? So environment specific configuration. So DB connections, Q connections. Sure. So you can um one of the options in the I think it's the, it's either the create or the start for the container. You can specify environment variables then for that particular copy of the container. So if you had multiple environments like a like a QA and a prod, you would have these tasks duplicated. There's some clever ways that you can do it in Gradle where you um, you don't have to like just copy and paste. You could you can create like a task rule that dynamically creates tasks based on what you actually type on the command line. So you could do that and then reference you know like pull environment variables from this other file based on, you know, if it's the QA environment, source this QA file first and pass those to the container. So you would have different environment, you would, you would do it that way. Um, and you would just, you're just defining that container with a different set of environment variables then. Any other questions or questions in general? This was basically the end of my presentation. <laughs> we kind of hit the end without a, <laughs> Oh, uh, one thing to mention, Docker security. Um, when you're doing this, so the Docker daemon <clears throat> runs as root on your machine that you're running at. Uh, so when you enable the HTTP interface on it, which is not enabled by default, um, if you so if you create a Linux box and just install Docker from like the app packages, uh, it doesn't talk on the HTTP port. It only talks on the Unix socket, which is limited to root, right? So good, you're, you're fine there. But if you create a machine with doc, with like Docker machine, uh, then it's expecting you to talk to that over the HTTP inter interface. So it opens that up. Well, any, it is, it is encrypted, right? So it's, so it's TLS, SSL, and, and it has a cert. So you, you would need the cert to send, to send any commands to it, but it's not authenticated in any way. So it, you don't you don't log in. You don't provide a username and password or anything like that. So it's it's open. It is it is encrypted, and you would still need the private certificate to do anything with it. But that's just something to be mindful of. Is if you're going to be using this kind of mechanism, you do have a potential, you know, security. You have a port open that could run things as root on your on your box. Um, yeah, that's just something to mention so that you're aware of it. Um, right. And that's actually all I have in slides. So does anyone have any other questions? No? Cool. Well, thank you guys for coming. Um, if you want to learn more about this stuff, uh, Ben Mushko actually wrote a book called Gradle in Action. It's a really great book if you're, if you're into, like, the DevOps and automation stuff. I would take it. He goes through a lot of different uh, scenarios and patterns and how you can do things with Gradle. Um, there's tons of information about Docker out there because it's kind of becoming the next big thing, if isn't already the next big thing. Um, so there's lots of people using it. Uh, there are people using it in production now, so there's not, you know, it's not a, oh, this is such a new thing, we can't, we can't use it for that stuff. No, people, people are deploying entire massive frameworks out there. A, a lot of the, like, uh, you know, SaaS providers out there and stuff are doing either Docker or something similar to Docker um, in order to get, you know, optimize their resource usage and everything. Uh, so, and then also you can always contact us at, at Object Partners or Twitter or me uh, or whatever you want to do and we can, you know, we can help you out with some of that stuff. Yeah. How does Gradle Gradle actually ships with an ability to import Maven files and convert them to Gradle. Uh, assuming that you're doing some basic stuff, if you're doing a bunch of like custom, like custom things inside of there, it won't understand that and it won't know how to convert it. Um, but they don't, they don't play together in any way, other than Gradle can understand Maven POM files from a dependency point of view. Um, but it does. What's that? Yep, it'll it it can read anything that supports the Maven protocol for for doing dependency resolution. So Nexus and Artifactory are the big ones. Gradle can read from those. Um, and if you're doing, if you have something that's slightly customized from that, I think you can configure like the, like the resource pattern naming scheme. Like if you have something that's not the default Maven pattern, you can configure that as well. Just like you do in like Ivy and stuff like that. So. Anyone else? Great.
All right. Thank you.